because running is one thing if you're running a race you have to finish it you have to stick with your training or you're not going to do well Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On this weekly show, you can listen in on my conversations with peak performing business leaders, creatives, and entrepreneurs. Every week, I bring you the latest scoop on what these incredible people do to succeed. Together, we explore how they think, what they do, and what inspires them to push their limits. Remember, if you have a question you'd like me to answer about creative thinking, innovation, or collaboration, head over to isoldat.com slash question and ask away. If your question is chosen and you leave your URL, I'll tag you and your business to elevate what you do too. And now, let's get on with the show. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am thrilled that you are here, and I'm also so thrilled with this week's guest. Portia Batum. Now, I should actually ask you, Portia, how do you say your name? Uh, you got it right. You get Ooh. it right. All right. It is Portia Batum. <laughs> Portia. And, See? Um, just like John ba- just like John Batum, who <laughs> was the great director and brother to Mary Batum, who played Scout in To Kill a Mockingbird. Wow. So there you go. So now Portia has, you, you've heard, she's got a gorgeous speaking voice, just so you know. But here's here, let me get back to the actual introduction. Portia Batum has worked as a print model and commercial actor since 2005. She's appeared in campaigns for Color Guard, Fidelis Healthcare, Emblem Health, MetLife, American Express, you name it, all sorts of places, right? In addition to her acting credentials, she also works as a casting assistant at Donna Grossman casting agency in Manhattan. And that's important because she's both a creative and a business person. And that's really something that I want to focus in on because nowadays, as you know, we can't just be creatives. We have to be business people as well. Outside of the talent industry, Portia spent more than 20 years as a PR and marketing consultant, providing communications counsel to a variety of clients, including Higher Purpose Productions, uh, Smarty Pants Pictures, Children's National Medical Center, St. Louis Children's Hospital, and many, many others. And she's held senior communications roles in healthcare and the advertising industry. Portia is an avid runner, and she devotes a lot of her time running to raise money for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society through its team and training program. She's participated in, in several half marathons. I can't even run around the block, so wow, several half marathons, and completed her first full marathon in Prague in the Czech, Czech Republic in May 2017. As a lymphoma survivor herself, she's a regular speaker at LLS events to share her personal journey through cancer, to inspire and lend support to patients and their families, and to encourage others to support cancer research. How fabulous is she? Portia, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Well, thank you for having me. And my gosh, I'm like waiting to see who is this person that you're describing is going to start <laughs> speaking. I can't wait to listen to them, whoever they are. Well, luckily it's you. So woohoo. <laughs> So I, this is, we met at, uh, in a class, didn't we? Is that how we met yes. here in New York yeah. City? Yeah, yeah, we immediately, I thought to myself, that statuous, amazing woman, I need to get to know her. So I'm so glad we've gotten a chance to know each other a little bit. And I'm so glad that you're here. You, you are a real Renaissance woman. Just looking and researching at some of the things you've done, you have so many interests. You have you know done so much work in PR and communications. You're an avid runner. You're an actor. You do so many things. It's called the curse of the creative. <laughs> I call it having a short attention span for myself. Well, it no, it truly is. And you know, if um, not to sound so um, new agey, um, which isn't so the term isn't so new anymore, but. Um, you know, true to my sign as Pisces, we are very creative people. And so I um, just can't can't quite get away from that. Mm -hmm. And I found that, yeah, I have done so many things because it's always finding that creative and I kind of get bored with things after a while and I'm on to what is the next thing to do. And, um, you know, even when I gave you some information so you could put together that wonderful intro that you did. Um, There's still some things that I really didn't even include in that Mm -hmm. 
you know, sometimes I think, oh my God, so if people say she does all of that, good heavens. But to me, it never seems like enough. So, um, uh, that's, that, that's sort of my, as I said, it's the curse of the creative. <laughs> It's interesting that you say that. My husband is a Pisces also, and he Good has, <laughs> yeah, I'm keeping him. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is interesting because it's the same sort of idea I think that he has and he, he gets bored easily and he runs from one thing to the next and is constantly doing something, whether he's drawing or painting or juggling or eating fire or walking on stilts or acting, whatever it is he's doing, he's doing something. And with you, when you're doing all of these different things, do you have, I'm going to ask a strange question because I normally ask how you got started, but I'm going to ask you right now, do you have a favorite of all the things that you do? What's the thing that makes you go, wow, I so love this. Um, you know, that's interesting. Um, I don't, and I probably should have a favorite, but I don't, but I can say whichever it is at the moment, what I think I have realized is what gives me the most joy is what I can really put my hands on and create. Because of course, you know, being creative can, can take many forms. Um, you can come up with creative ideas that are then, for example, in my work that I did um, as a PR marketing person, oftentimes I was creating ideas that I was passing on to my client that perhaps they were going to be involved with implementing. So it was the wonderful idea of creating that, which excited me, but I find the hands-on part of creativity, I think is what really kind of rocks me the most. Um, as you know, we were chatting before we started uh, in our unofficial chat, I decided that I wanted something different to put the herbs in that I usually plant on my deck in pots. So I decided, okay, what can I do? I looked on Pinterest, I saw this wonderful vertical garden that they used pallets to do to make that. And I thought, I don't want to do pallets. That's just like opening up a box and assembling a couple pieces. So I designed the whole thing myself. And it was the process of creating the idea, planning it out, going to Home Depot, have, asking the guys who work there, picking the wood, measuring it, having them cut some pieces, other pieces I could cut at home, putting it together, learning how to not split wood when you're, you know, using that um, impact driver and coming up with this finished project that I can sit and look at. That whole process, because it really incorporates a lot. It's hands-on, but you've got to use some analytical skills you've got to learn how to ask questions uh, and you have to learn how to sometimes improvise on the fly. And I think it's all of those pieces put together when you really are hands on that thrills me the most. And I think that's what, as I said, you know, really rocks me um, about creativity and, and doing all that. That's so fascinating because it's, it, you can break that process down into learning an instrument, into mm -hmm. learning how to paint, into exactly. learning dance moves. It's, it's ultimately the same process of coming up with the idea, but the mm -hmm. idea is not the only thing. It's, oh. as you put it, the, the manifestation of it. How do, you, how do you personally create the thing you've decided you're going to design? Exactly. Now, had you ever design, designed anything before or did you just go, I saw this on Pinterest and now I'm going to do it? Well, yes, I, um, uh, about a year or so ago, um, I moved into my new house about uh, almost four years ago and was fortunate enough to be able to kind of design and, and decorate it top to bottom when I moved, but I couldn't find a coffee table that I liked. Mm. So I literally went two and a half years without a coffee table. Not that 
in the grand scheme of life that that's a huge deal. But it was sort of that one piece that would sort of finish off my living room for me. Mm -hmm. And I decided I could, I'm one when I can't find something, then I make it. I used to be that way as a kid when, you know, didn't have a lot of money to always buy new stuff. And I would want a new outfit to wear to whatever school thing or party or event. And I would make it. And I would sometimes have in my head what I wanted and I couldn't find it. So I would get the closest pattern. I would alter that and make it the way I wanted. And so that's what I did with my coffee table. I looked <laughs> Again, um, on Pinterest and some other places, saw a couple of ideas. Had one idea here, one idea there. I knew I wanted the big old like caster wheels uh -huh. um, that looked like the railroad wheels. I knew I wanted that. Mm -hmm. It started with I saw um, a type of sort of shiplap wood um, again at Home Depot, and I going to be the top. And then it, the idea just continued from there. And this one I literally designed and then created. And now it's my wonderful dining, uh, co living room coffee table. That's fascinating. I love it. I, that I, was, I, that's probably the first, the first real thing that I tackled that I didn't have a clue what I was doing. But in my head, um, you know, um, I was a great carpenter. I love that. Let me ask you then, how important do you think it is to have the vision in your head before you start? Or is it okay to go, I'm just going to see what happens when it comes to designing something like that? Since now you're not such a newbie. I mean, you're still a newbie compared to like a professional carpenter. Exactly. But, but how important is that imagining, that envisioning of what you wanted it to look like to the whole process of making it happen? Well, see, I don't think one is exclusive to the other mm -hmm. because I still think the idea in your head isn't, because it's in your head, right? It's this idea that um, it, it's almost as if you um, have a uh, telescope and you're, you're looking at, you're trying to find something on the horizon and you have to turn it to focus in or focus out. So you, you kind of know what you're looking for, but you have to fine tune it. And I see it as that same thing. You have an idea in your head, but that doesn't mean as you go about creating that idea that, that, process, that you still can't be fluid with what's in your head. Unless you've got just this absolute picture that there's no budging off of it but you know that's half of the fun of creativity it's almost never what you start out with is what you end up with because you find as you go along sometimes there are obstacles that come up and you realize the way you wanted to do it is not going to work so now you have to come up with a creative way to make it work which may not have been what you started with and then the end result, for me anyway, almost always ends up even better than what I originally had planned for. Um, the vertical garden that I was going to build, I was going to just uh, make the planter boxes and, and screw them in and have it stationary. And in talking with the, one of the uh, staff people at um, the store where I went to purchase the materials, he suggested, because I showed him this picture that I, I was loosely working off of, and he suggested, you know, why don't you put, you can, I have something I can show you that is bendable that you can make hooks, and that way you can hook them on, and that way you never have to have the same pattern. You could move them around. And initially, in my mind, I'm thinking, that's not what's in my head. I want it this way. And mm -hmm. he showed me, and then suddenly I had this epiphany. It was like, wow. Yeah, because then I could change the design and I could change the depth and make it look different every year. And for me, that always things changing, that was appealing to me. And now I did it that way and I love it even better, but that's not what was in my head originally mm -hmm. because I was opening, open to hearing another idea that I could take and run with it and kind of make it my own and make it work for me.
Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like that staying flexible and allowing a collaboration of sorts with the guy at the store and, exactly. and you know, and the things on Pinterest or whatever mm -hmm. made it even better than it would have otherwise been. And, you know, and that's almost true with everything. You know, I used to call it, and I sort of still do, but I used to call it my plan B life because I find that whenever you are working on what is starting out going to be plan A, you know, things come along that forces you to have to change. And I always say, what's plan B? Now, some people go on the theory of, well, I'm not going to have plan B because I know plan A is not going to, is going to work. Mm -hmm. And then I think, no, you know, I always want to have plan B because the time it will take me to think of plan B later is the time that I could have been making it happen if I already had anticipated plan B. So in some ways that flexibility is also about having the plan B, whether you have it pre-planned or not, but recognize that sometimes plan B is necessary and plan B can be even better. And you know, if I go back, and I would probably say a lot of us can look at that, if I go back and I look at just where I am now in terms of what I do as an actor, as a PR person, um, and as a creative, and there's certainly the cre each of those three things flow through each other. Um, this is probably not where I thought I was going to be when I first started out. But then again, yes, because if you look at life taking a 360, I initially in high school had decided towards my senior year that I was going to be a fashion designer. And I actually came to New York, went to FIT, was very frustrated because there's a process you have to follow. You had to learn, you had to sketch first. And then after you sketched, you had to drape. And then after you drape, you made the pattern. And then after you made the pattern, you then made the outfit. And the way, you know, my creative brain works, I would see something in my head and I would want to skip all those pieces and just go about the hands-on making of it. And I found I was very frustrated because they forced me to have to go into that process and I couldn't sketch and I hated my sketching. And because that was the starting point and they would let me skip my, I became very frustrated going about and pursuing that particular career. And so I changed my major and I looked back at what I had been doing as a kid where all my other classmates had been sketching and creating. I had been writing and I realized, okay, I'm going to do that. And that set me on the trajectory of wanting to be in advertising as a copywriter and not being able to get a job doing that. So I ended up as a reporter, which is completely um, opposite end of the spectrum, but that set me on the route of being a reporter and then going into PR and then having this PR and marketing career. But all the while that creative didn't go away. And as I then worked as a consultant and then had the opportunity to infuse the creative again, initially I did it as I started making jewelry. And then from jewelry, I segued into handbags. And then from creating handbags, I segued into taking small pieces of furniture that I would find at flea markets and stripping them and hand painting designs on them. Um, and from that, I started physically making pieces of furniture. So it's, it's, this is not where I thought I might be at this juncture. If I look at where I was when I started out, what I thought I knew what I was gonna do. But the end result now really is sort of a manifestation of that creativity that I was seeking at the very beginning that just did not go away. And for some people, it may not be, you know, creative. It might be, you know, the very analytical part. It may be 
you know, the, the numbers crunching part of it, that they always look at things from a, you know, numbers standpoint, you know, whatever that is for whoever that is, you know, we, we don't necessarily end up where we thought we were going to be, but I'm positive that whatever that is, it's still, it, you still get back to where you, you were going to, um, what was that sort of launching pad for you? Yeah. And, yeah. I can, and, and I can see that. And it's interesting because it's almost like no matter how far you stray, to explore the other avenues, you end up where you were supposed to be going all along, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, but, but at the same time, you, you said so much in here that I'm really curious about. One of the things is the, that the creative drive, that creative spark, mm -hmm. even when you were at FIT, which is the Fashion Institute of Technology, if you're listening to this and you don't know what that is here in New York City. Uh, so at the FIT, or working in you know PR and marketing, I can certainly see where creativity doesn't go anywhere. It's so it's so thinking creatively, thinking innovatively, using that ingenuity is so important to all of those. And yet, it sounds like you had on top of that, especially at FIT, your own your own process for making these things happen. And I, I understand you said you know you were frustrated with the the structure of FIT but after that after after the frustration after you moved into something else did you keep for example doing the clothing design or did you are you the kind of creative who goes okay I tried that for a while and I've done that and now I'm moving on to something else um when I'm actually when I moved into the writing aspect of my life. Um, I didn't, I didn't continue with the creative right away other than I think I was still making my clothes mm -hmm. and, or if I got something, I would alter it. Um, and I don't, other than that, the creative, you know, didn't quite happen. Although even in the writing, you had to be creative. Um, you had to take a creative approach. Um, in order to get the information that you needed, you had to be creative. Um, but now that you actually asked me that question, I realized the way the, the creative then came out at that point was that's when I started working with a community theater group. Mm, and that so. was going to be my next question. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's so interesting because, you know, it performing is, is certainly obviously one of the, one of the ways we can be creative writing obviously is one when you were doing copywriting, some of that is extremely, a lot of it, I would imagine, is extremely creative. And, and yet it doesn't sound like it was enough because you were like, okay, then I have to go do theater. And, and suddenly that became another avenue for you. Can you talk a little bit about that, about what, what were the creative muscles doing in your PR and your copywriting work that was insufficient to, to sort of make you go, okay, I have to go do acting now. Well, okay. So when I left FIT, left New York, and I went back home to Baltimore, I tried to get a job working in advertising as a copywriter. And Baltimore is not necessarily a, a haven of the advertising world by any stretch of the imagination. There's sure. certainly um, a fairly large um, advertising agency there but I was not able to get a job anywhere. And, you know, um, I don't mean to stray, but it, it is somewhat relevant right now. When I look at the um, problems of, and how even today in advertising, they, there are the number of minorities um, that are hired and then also sort of particularly in management roles is really very small. And that was pretty much one of the reasons that I was not able to get a job in mm. 
back then is I couldn't, I couldn't break that, um, you know, sort of mold there. And, and again, that was sort of a challenge because the, being able to be a copywriter would have brought that creativity every day because you'd have to create, you know, creative copy and ideas for campaigns and such wasn't able to do that but you know i needed a job and i was able to get a use my writing skills and i ended up as a reporter so there's not a lot of creativity in writing a news story i can tell you <laughs> um, and there might even be more so today because you know some of it you know is fused with culture and entertainment and all of that that was not the case you know a hundred years ago when i was a reporter um, <laughs> But you still had to be creative in your approach. And what I found that I would always take an opportunity to be able to write a feature story because that allowed me the aspect for being creative. Um, and I did that and then thought, eh, okay, need something else, was looking for something else. And then I got involved with, um, on a whim, I went for an audition and it got the role and then not only worked as an actor with the company, but I would work as a stage manager. I would help, I would do the design costumes for some of the plays and put that together. So there lies the, uh, the other creative aspect. And from there, you know, it, it, it was enough to keep the creative, juices at that time going mm -hmm. and i think as i went down the road like a little shop of horrors that needed more and more and more so i kept saying feed me see more you know <laughs> i needed more of that creative food as it were now it's so interesting that you say that first of all what theater since i lived in in the dc baltimore area for so long what theater company was it that you were with it was called Arena Players. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, it was at that time, and it still does exist, which I think now it totally bears um, this uh, description. But at the time, it was one of the oldest Black community theaters in the country. Mm -hmm. um, I think it started, in, it was founded in 1950. 53 or 54 um, by a gentleman named Sam Wilson mm -hmm. and uh, um, and it that theater continues on to this day I mean has sometimes operated on a shoestring but you know the fact that it has survived all this time just sort of speaks volumes that's fantastic I love it so okay so we've we've we're in journalism mm -hmm. and we're I love that we're doing this all sort of as a timeline and you started doing community theater mm -hmm. how long were you doing that and what prompted the move more into the PR and communications aspect of what you were doing as opposed to the journalism um well anger <laughs> oh all right then that would be my if i had to answer in one word anger um i was working i had um segued from newspaper to radio mm -hmm. and as a news anchor and then from radio i segued to television with the hope of being on air mm -hmm. but started out as a news writer mm -hmm. and the news director who hired me was actually going to give me that chance to do what's called the morning cut in. So if, let's say you're watching good morning America, and you know, at 25 after the hour, um, there's the five minute newscast. Mm -hmm. Well, that is also true locally. And I would have had a chance to do the local five minute newscast. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to sort of get down my writing skills first for couple of months and unfortunately they fired him oh no and the new guy who came on i very nicely after he had been on board for about a month 
set up a meeting and marched into his office and told him about the arrangement that the previous news director and I had and how I was, you know, wanted, these were my goals and ambitions. And he smiled at me and said, oh, I think you'll make a great reporter. It's just not going to happen here. And I was one crushed and two very, very pissed off and angry. Sure. Um, because I had already worked as a newspaper reporter for five years. I had worked as a radio news anchor for three years. So I knew I had the qualifications to start off in TV. I didn't think I needed to go back to a town smaller than Baltimore mm -hmm. to come forward again. If I was just starting out completely, then yeah, that made sense. So, you know, I, I got very angry and um, not that I gave up on that idea, but at that point I thought, well, maybe it's just too much too late. And that's when I, uh, someone in the city who knew my background and knew about my work had been for about a year trying to convince me to come work at his hospital as the head of PR. And I walked out of that meeting. I called his office and said, okay, I'm ready to come join you. And I left about two or three months later. And that was my start in PR. Wow. And once I got involved in it, I then subsequently, that was in Baltimore, I left and that's when I ended up at Children's uh, National Medical Center in DC. Mm -hmm. And it was very, it, time just didn't allow for me to um, work in DC and make it back to Baltimore in time for rehearsals. I just couldn't manage the two. And that's when my work with the theater company, I had to let go. Mm -hmm. Oh, so yeah. And traffic in DC <laughs> is, is no. uh, prohibitive. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay. So you took on this PR role at children's and, um, one of get, the best jobs ever. Oh, I'm sure it was really rewarding as well as being like good work. I'm sure it's incredibly, incredibly rewarding. So, so let me, let me ask you what, what, because I know I, this is a strange thing to say, but I know public relations is creative, mm -hmm. but how do you make a hospital sound awesome? How do you, what is the creative path that you take to do PR for a hospital and make it sound like this amazing, incredible place. And and don't get me wrong, I understand hospitals save lives and mm -hmm. make a difference in the lives of children every day and, and other obviously adults and all that, I get that. But as from, from that creative standpoint, what did you do to elevate children's hospitals sort of mystique almost as a creative? Well, you know what, it luckily, children's i walked into a role and a job that this institution was already world recognized mm. so luckily it was not about having to uh build a reputation and get people to pay attention to this place what it was was looking at the programs that we had and getting visibility for those or getting people engaged with those and letting people know about the myriad of services that we had. Um, and if you look at it and say, well, how do you do that creatively? Oftentimes it may have been through events. And, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to work for a hospital, not that I, I've worked for an adult facility as well, and I've had adult facilities as clients, but to work at a children's hospital, is the opportunity to be the most creative. Because a lot of times what you're doing is creating programs for your patients that may have a news value to it. Mm. Um, and to work with kids and create these programs and you know, partner with some of the different departments that involved these kids and see the joy that they had. Um, I remember putting on 
an event that it was a, a show that aired out of Washington called Rap City. Mm-hmm. And we were able to convince them to tape their show in the lobby of our hospital, which mm-hmm. meant all of these different rap artists were going to be coming. Wow. It was, it was so much fun. Um, another thing that we did, which um, I always sort of will say these are some of my great moments, I had a chance to work with several first ladies because it was a tradition for the first lady to come to children's each year to do the annual Christmas visit. Mm. We would put on a program. A lot of it was with the children and then they would tour. Um, And I remember it started, I worked with Nancy Reagan and then uh, Barbara Bush. And it was right after Barbara Bush that I then left children's and took a position up in New York. But to put on the program and coordinate that and work with her advanced people and come up with, you know, what the program was going to involve and work with her staff to determine whether she's going to read a story or she's going to tour and all of that. That again was a, another part of the creative aspect. Mm-hmm. All the while that you're going to be dealing with the news media who's going to be coming to cover it. And with um, Barbara Bush, she came there's a show called Christmas in Washington that mm-hmm. airs every year. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I've not watched it lately. So I don't know if they still are involved with um, children's. But the person who produced that, George Stevens Jr., um, was had a very special connection to children's. And I don't now remember what that was. But he wanted to make sure children's was involved. And when... Nancy Reagan was in office, uh, was first lady. She was, she and her husband, the president, Ronald Reagan, were very close friends with Bob Wright, who was the chairman of NBC. And Nancy would come and after the show aired and present a check to Children's, which would be um, donated from NBC as part of their advertising revenue from the show. Hmm. Barbara Bush did it a different way. She wanted to come prior to and take a tape a segment reading a Christmas story to the kids that she wanted included in the show. Mm. So then that became creating the space, deciding on the kids, working with them for which story would work, working with the crew to you know set up the space, and then coordinating all of that video that was going to be included in the show that ended up in the final project. So again, that was all a creative aspect. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, there's creativity. I go back to it as creativity in almost anything that you do. It's all in, you know, it goes back to the all in the idea, you know. Um, and there's a friend of mine that actually, we, we, we worked together at Children's Hospital and we would always say to each other, you know, you're only limited by your imagination. Completely true. Absolutely yep. true. You know, I, I look at it as the, I know what let's do thing. You know, it's, it's, yeah. that, it's that spark of inspiration. And, and no matter who you are, no matter what you do with your time or for a living, I think if you, if you have that in your life, if you have mm-hmm. that spark of inspiration, then, then automatically, you know, <laughs> by, by the rules of physics, you automatically are creative, exactly. even if it's not what you do for, for your even career. Even if some people see jobs and they automatically label it as a creative job. Um, but, you know, oftentimes, and I think I, I may have mentioned this earlier, you know, creativity isn't always just the doing, it's the creative thinking as well. And that's just as important, you know, absolutely, absolutely. No matter what the job is, uh, so I love it. I love it. It's true. You know, it's kind of like you. You know, if you're if you take if you don't spend time writing today, if you're writing a book, but you spend time thinking about the plot or the characters, that's right. still part of the writing process. Right. And, and, I, and I always love to keep that in the back of my mind when I start feeling guilty for not doing more than I'm doing. So I, I would like to, if it's okay with you, pivot just a little bit and talk to you about, about acting 
and you've done you've done stage work you've done camera work you've done a ton of commercials all of these things mm -hmm. and and there's something that i'm curious about for you specifically because you've done so many commercials you know i i can ask an actor what is it like to build a character mm -hmm. but when you're talking about with a commercial you have actually very little time often to build a character or like in a video game you get the script seconds before you go on mm -hmm. what do you do to to inhabit a character quickly like for a commercial or for a video game um you know you i often think that my ability to create characters um and forgive me but i'm just gonna say it this way i think that i think i suck at that <laughs> <laughs> okay big, 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 big well, reveal here Which, i don't i don't believe that portia but okay keep going <laughs> Hear me out. There, there really is a method to my madness for that line of thinking. Okay. Because I have not done, you know, since my theater days. And, you know, when I did community theater back in Baltimore, I, I can tell you, I didn't have a clue. You know, I, I did the roles and, you know, not that they weren't, um, the productions weren't great, but it was still community theater. It wasn't, you know, higher level mm -hmm. but at the same time i did those characters but you know if i look back on it now i would probably cringe and say oh gosh i was so awful but and i wonder i didn't really explore that a lot because you know i have to tell you how i got into this in the commercial thing and then i'll answer how it is that i sort of I'm able to quickly generate whatever the character is at the moment. Mm -hmm. When I came to New York and started working, didn't think about acting. And I didn't think about acting because in my mind, I was Portia from little old Baltimore community theater that could not compare to the acting world here in New York. And mm -hmm. no one would even think I was worthy. So I never even remotely thought about doing anything. Never gave it a thought. Fascinating. I ended up my next door, a person who moved next door to me that I got to meet, and he is a very, very dear friend now, is the owner of an acting studio. And it was at his urging that I start doing commercial print and commercials because he said you know you have this great look you, you have a great voice you really should be doing this and the first thing i said to him was oh no i could never do that i did that back in baltimore but i couldn't i couldn't do that here and he said yes you could and i said no no and he said you should model and in my head i hear model and i'm thinking vogue and i said oh no i'm definitely not small enough to be a model. No, 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 not that kind of model, real person model. I'm like, what's that? Now you would think a person who works in PR that has some advertising background would have connected the dots that, oh yeah, those people you see in the Tide commercial are actors. Yeah, right, real people. Never connected those dots. Wow. To this day, I still don't know why not. But, <laughs> So I said, I ignored him because I thought he was just being nice as my next door neighbor and friend. And, you know, I finally, when it was about a year later and he kind of said it again, he had some friends over who worked in the industry and they all thought I did. And I said, oh, you all had a conversation, right? He tried to get you to convince me too. And they said, no. And then I realized, oh, okay. So then it was, well, what if, I try this just to prove him wrong, not prove him right, prove him wrong, because this could never happen, right? Mm. And I said, okay, I have no idea what to do. He helped me with everything, suggested a photographer, helped me pick out my headshots, suggested classes for me to take, did those. And the next thing I know, I was picked up by an agent. And I just sort of, again, started asking questions and figured it out along the way. And my life initially started more so in print. And I think every now and again, I might do 
uh, commercial, but it was primarily print. Mm -hmm. And I had to say to come back to your answer of how you do that, because I think in print, you don't have the time, you've got to convey that expression, that look, that feeling. You can't say any, you're not saying anything. You're not acting and moving. You're showing a facial expression that's standing still. Mm -hmm. And it takes something to convey that because that's what you've got to get for the camera. Mm -hmm. And I think doing that first gave me the preparation to be able to kind of quickly convey what I needed to in a commercial. Because again, you don't have a lot of time. And I guess I don't see it developing a character. And the people that do this will probably say, what is she talking about? But this is for me. When I do commercials, I don't see it so much creating a character as much as for me, it's the other way around. It's just me with that particular issue or problem. Which, of course, every actor, even in acting roles, really brings a piece of themselves into a character. But mm -hmm. typically, that character may be very different from who they are. Um, you know, Anthony Hopkins is not Hannibal, Hannibal Lecter. You know, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> At least he's not been caught, right? Right. <laughs> but, but you know, but there there was something about that um, character that he drew upon that was something in him that he brought to that character. When I am sort of doing commercials, I don't see it as the person who's the character. I see it as Portia having the problem. So I'm really Portia in that commercial so mm -hmm. she's the character she's not this other defined character that they've created and that's how i i work it for me that mm -hmm. may not be how other actors do it but you know for my commercial work that's how i do it for me you know the recent thing that i did with cola guard um i just sort of you know i'm being sort of very matter of fact about something that oh i don't have to worry about this it doesn't run in my family you know and i could that was the very matter of fact me that i can be sometimes and so i didn't see that as oh i've got to figure out how to be that character it was like no this is just how portia would say it and do it and that's what governs my commercial work so that's so interesting because uh there are so many times in acting, in in voice acting, which I know you, of course, also do and, and are great at, that you that you need to come up with only, con, you know, conveying something with only your voice. Right. And when you do that in when you're doing a commercial that's a, a VO a voiceover, when you're just voice acting or or a video game or something like that, do you do the same thing or is there a different process? It's sort of the same thing because, you know, as you know, from our having done some of the classes together, you know, what I see and, you know, I think all, all actors, whether they're commercial actors, whether they're legit actors or theater actors, voiceover actors are always trying to be their best self, as it were, at their craft. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people are farther along down the road than others. You know, we're all wherever we are on our journey. And I still think as a voiceover actor, I'm still somewhat at the beginning. Now, some people will say, oh, but you have a great voice. But, and, you know, yeah, okay, I, I'll, I'll spot you that maybe. But at the same time, which you do, <laughs> you have a great voice. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean you know how to, you know, for example, I may have a great car. I may not how to know how to drive that car well mm -hmm. to get the best performance out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I see it the same way. I still think I have, as voiceover goes, a lot to learn because one of the things that you do, as I was about to say before, um, that you are aware of, I'm still trying to get outside of my news reader head because mm -hmm. I always feel like so much of my delivery 
sounds like a news read and not a natural read. And I, it's just in my head that it's so a part of me that I really have to work hard to get past that because when I, someone else will hear it, but when I hear it, I still hear the news read, even if I've been able to kind of get away from that. So that's sort of my biggest challenge that I am still working on. And again, trying to, like in the commercials, sound more just like me than me, the news anchor. And I struggle with that. I really do. Um, and I don't, I'm nowhere near where I want to be. And I know I still need uh, a lot of practice to get away from that uh, for a number of reasons. One, it doesn't work in everything. And two, even in those roles that are more announcer roles and not character roles in voiceover, they're not doing them the sort of, you know, uh, I'm, you know, Joe Radio reading this. Um, you know, it's not the Edward R. Murrow read of, you know, before. Mm -hmm. uh, but that sort of what I struggle with. So I don't quite think I have the answer to that question of how do I do that? Because I don't think I'm doing it quite well yet. And that's so interesting because I've heard you read. We've been in classes together and I think you're terrific. And you sound, I, I understand where you're coming from as far as the announcer voice. I get it because I came up and started doing voiceover in the 80s and that's when they wanted that kind of read. And so when you right. start doing it that way and now we are in a very different mm -hmm. set of criteria, if you will, you know, so, so I get it. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. And at the same time, I think that to me, acting is, it's a never ending process. You know, you can keep plumbing the depths and go deeper and deeper and deeper. And so I think you are, but you're on a journey like everybody else is, you know what I mean? I think you're doing it, but you're on, you're on a certain point of, of your particular journey. And, and so that, that, that asks that, that begs my question, what's the, what's the end goal of your acting journey? Do you have a role that you most want to play or is this like you're a working actor and you do your thing and you go home and you enjoy your vertical garden? Oh my gosh. That makes me sound so official. Um, and I guess part of it is, you know, we all have sort of those voices inside our head. I have a big voice inside my head that I actually call the obnoxious roommate in my head. <laughs> and I've even given her name. Her name is Wilhelmina. And, you know, Wilhelmina says a lot to me. A lot of times I have to tell her to be quiet, go sit over here, don't say anything right now. <laughs> sometimes she will um, cooperate and sometimes she refuses. But, um, you know, I don't think, and I think it goes probably back to those days at Arena Players, you know, to see myself as the actor that would do, you know, would have that ambition of playing this particular role, you know, that I, I don't. And by virtue of the fact of being asked the question makes me feel like, oh my gosh, I really should have that, but I don't because I, you know, there are lots of other people out there that really want to be, you know, the major, you want to be the Meryl Streeps of the world and, and on and on. And I don't think that's ever what I wanted. I think I wanted it way back, you know, in the galaxy far, far away. Mm. But I don't know that that was what I ever wanted to do. So there, there's no role. Um, I love doing the print work that I do. I love doing the commercials that I do. Um, if I were to do theater, I don't think I would ever do Broadway. 
I don't know that I would do off-Broadway. If there were a theater company somewhere that I could do a role and not freak out, I mean, not that I wouldn't take it seriously, but there's a certain level that um, I would go become so obsessive and crazy and you know, again, Wilhelmina would be telling me that I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, you didn't do this right, you didn't do that right, that I, it would put so much undue pressure on me mm -hmm. that I would not survive it. So I sometimes realize mm, maybe not something you should do to yourself. So I leave that, I don't want to take up that space for those who are far more interested in those kinds of roles than I am. I mean, it's rare. I, uh, again, wow, it was, I can't believe it's been a year ago already, but um, it was April, I think, of last year. I was sort of beside myself when I went out for a role on um, Black, the Blacklist. And the scene would have been with James Spader. And of course, the whole idea just gave me a nervous stomach for days. Mm. Well, I didn't get a call back. So my stomach quickly got back to normal. <laughs> and it didn't have, interestingly enough, it didn't have any lines. The character that I was playing was someone who was close to him and a friend. And I um, was a maitre d' at a restaurant and he was at his safe house and I was, um, had brought in a catered meal for him and mm -hmm. I was setting up everything. And so we just have the hello, you know, the hellos and we hug and, and I basically am showing everybody, you know, taking the lids off the food so they could eat. Mm -hmm. And that would have been enough for me. You know, I didn't have to be the bad guy with the gun or the cop or anything like that. That would have been enough but um, that I didn't get. But the fact that I had a chance to go out for it just says, well, you know, you get a chance to work on that. But those would be the kind of things that would make me happy and content with what I do. Um, you know, it, sometimes it's realizing you shouldn't always go after something just because you think you should. Um, you really, you know, at least for me, I'm one that I think I've got to really have the passion in it. Otherwise, I'm really, one, not going to do well, or I'm not going to finish it, or I'm not going to do it the way I really want to. Which is interesting because um, the one sort of piece that we didn't talk about, the running aspect I've realized that part of the, when I was going through, um, if we can just sort of digress for a moment, when I was going through chemo, you know, it is something that strips you of any semblance of strength and energy. And as physically fit as I had been before that, I was sort of feeling like I may never get that back again. And I have no idea why, but I decided when I finished, I would start running, which I had never done before. And I actually hated running. But, you know, I realized that my choosing running wasn't, while I did choose it to get, you know, get my strength back and, and take on something that was a challenge that wasn't thrown upon me. And also at the same time, raise money for a very important cause, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. But what I realized is, as crazy as it sounds, the running taps back into the creative and getting bored in life. Because running is one thing, if you're running a race, you have to finish it. You have to stick with your training or you're not going to do well. Mm. So there's a certain amount of commitment you have to take. You have to be creative with when you can fit in your time for your runs and where you can do them and how you do them. Um, and, but most importantly, you've got to finish it. And it was at that point in my life that running became this something that I could take on that really forced me 
to be involved, to be engaged, to, you know, if it was raining on a particular day, then I had to be creative to say either, what are you going to wear while you're out there running? Or if you can't run the day and you know you've got to get an X amount of miles by this particular day, how are you going to do that? But you had to figure it out. And it satisfied that need. And, you know, again, crazy as it sounds, no one would ever think running is something that, you know, um, you could look at strategically or you could look at creatively. And I think the reasons I ended up doing that actually satisfied both of those. Fascinating. And it's, it's, oh, hold on one sec. It's interesting that within that, that you're maintained, like, you, you know, you're truly a creative spirit. And so even with something like running, which I, 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 I literally about half a block and then my knees hurt. So I don't, I don't run. Uh, but, but it's interesting to me how many people I know who are actors. Uh, my friend Mason is all, she's a triathlete, you know, that that's one of the things that she does. And I know a lot of people who say that one of the things that happens when they run is they get ideas mm -hmm. is, is that, is that creativity just flourishes for them. And sometimes they have to stop and grab their phone and record whatever thought they had, because, it's a time for when your body is doing something that your mind can wander and imagine. Does that work for you as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I find that there's that one time that I can just sort of let everything go. Um, and I end up creating if there's something I need to write often the whole, the copy will come to me. If it's something that I want to make, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can be actually literally, I can tell you, I was visiting a friend in Southern Maryland, has a home near on the water. And I got up one morning and I was taking a run and um, running along and I literally see some tree branches that had fallen. And I, I looked at those, I stopped, I picked them up and I said, oh my gosh, this would make a beautiful, I could use this to make a beautiful wind chime. And I had found some little bells at a little shop some down in New Jersey um, in uh, the New Hope area. And I thought this would be perfect because I had gotten those bells and saying one day I'm going to make a wind chime. And mm -hmm. I thought it would. And it was while I was running that I just looked over and saw these tree branches that had fallen. And I think the way some of the bark had come off and some of it was smooth and some of it was rough. It just, I looked at it in that moment and I could see the creativity in it. And it was while I was running. I love that. That, that, that on top of the creativity inside yourself, it was found art, you know, happenstance yeah. art that, that you exactly. came across. Ah, uh, that's terrific. So I have one other area that I would like to ask you mm -hmm. about if it's okay. You're a, you work at a casting agency. So what, what does that, what sort of things do you do as a, as a person who works in casting? Cause you, you're on both sides of, of, of that, uh, arena, if you will, you've got, you're an actor, but you're also, you work in casting and how does that work? And what do you, what sort of things do you do as, as someone who works in casting? So, um, I, my work at the agency, um, involves a couple of different things. Um, I'm pretty much running the waiting area where everyone is coming in and signing in and making sure paperwork is filled out, people are going in at the right order, that hopefully we don't get backed up, that people are wearing what they're supposed to wear, because uh, oftentimes it's very specific. And, you know, we cast a number of different, you know, categories and ages because we do adults and children. And we do print as well as commercial and um and oftentimes we're doing not that we do specific fashion but there are times we're doing some products that sort of fall in that category like we may be doing 
sunglasses. So the types of people that we're bringing in are going to fall more along those that work more so as models than actually actors. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself brings a different type of person with different sensibilities when they're coming for their castings. But in addition, um, I'm working with the, I work with the different agents um, of people they're submitting. Um, I'm often making selection, working with the casting director on um, some selections of people that maybe we're going to bring in, um, often when we're narrowing down what the choices are. But the interesting thing about working there in that role that if I compare it to my work as an actor, I can say it's been very insightful because I get a chance now, and I'm not always involved in all the decisions of who's chosen, but I'm in the room when it is. And so I had a chance to learn from that in terms of roles and what people bring to it when they're casting. And you know, you have some people that come in and take it seriously. There's some that just roll in and do it. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, it impacts the choices. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're required, if they're saying you need to come in workout clothing, because that's, you know, what the scene is going to require, then pay attention to what's written in the information that you get and come in workout clothes. You know, don't come in jeans and a top and say, oh, I didn't realize I needed to. Well, if it said that's what's needed, then that's what you need to wear. Um, because if they can't really envision you in that, and they really need to see what you're going to look out and work out gear, you know, don't you think that that might impact a choice at the end of the day? And I, I guess I'm still surprised how many actors who come, who are on this, I guess, automatic pilot, like, they get a casting, they come and they figured whatever I have on that day is fine. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had some people on the other hand and I say kudos to them. They have come and they come in because they've stopped at the Nordstrom rack near our offices or they've stopped at Target or somewhere because they realized they didn't have what they were supposed to wear. Mm -hmm. So they, so they, went, so they, went, to, they went to that store. They've asked me, um, is there a restroom I need to change? And they go down the hall and they come back and they're in what they need to wear. Now, having a lab coat sure is a simple thing, you know, and I would say anybody that's ever going to go out for anything medical, there are times that the casting director may have lab coats. We do. So people are in luck with us because Donna Grossman is such a wonderful casting director. She tries to have and equip the talent that's coming in to give them the best head start. And we have so many different types of items, including workout clothes, but sometimes mm -hmm. what we have may not fit everyone who's coming in. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really about paying attention, you know, reading the information you get from your agent. And if it's not included, ask, don't say, well, the agent didn't tell me. Well, okay, ask, you know, and as I said, I, I'm amazed to see how many people who show up, who show up halfway. And I've realized it makes a difference. I also have learned a lot when I have not gotten something that I thought, well, darn, I thought I really got that one. And you don't hear anything and you don't hear anything. And of course, in this business, you have to have a thick skin because not everybody's going to get everything. And as you would like to think, it wasn't necessarily because I didn't do a good job. Sometimes it's just a matter of what they are looking for. Sure. And sure. they don't know it until it walks into the room. Uh, and I learned how to let go of the choices even more. Because a lot of times what I've realized, um, particularly working at Donna's, that we always don't find out about after we've gone in for something, that oftentimes the client will totally change their mind what they're looking for, mm -hmm. and they will totally recast it. So we may see a number of people for something, 
that they will say, mm, no, we've changed and it's really going to be this now. And then the specs for what we're looking for, we have to completely change and bring in a whole new set of people. Well, those people who came in originally, unfortunately, are just thinking, I didn't get the job. They're not knowing that they didn't get the job because mm -hmm. the specs clearly changed and it didn't apply to them anymore, right. which is a lot right. different than just not getting it. Mm -hmm. And so it really, I think I walk out of other castings now, even though I was okay with not getting it, I'm even more so okay when I don't because I realize now there's a lot that may have happened with that decision that I'm not aware of. And it didn't have, it may not have had anything to do with the job, the, what I did when I walked in the room. Absolutely. It, it, it's funny. I remember I auditioned for a commercial where they had said they wanted someone, you know, in my age range with my kind of voice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I auditioned and heard back and they were like, we love you. We're looking at two other people. And I went, great. And then I heard the commercial. <laughs> a few weeks later, I heard the commercial and I went, hey, I, I auditioned for that. And it was like a, an 18 year old young woman talking. And I'm like, okay, that obviously, because <laughs> that was not the spec that I'd right. gotten, you know? So, so yeah, absolutely. I can see that. But, but let me, let me ask you, there's so much that goes on sort of in, in, in that casting office, you know, that, that you're, you're talking to agents, all of these things happen. What, you know, a casting, a, an actor working with casting agencies, they need an agent, I'm assuming. And, and if so, what steps should an actor go through to get represented by an agent? So um, I'll sh share how I did it. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to, um, in the spirit of being fair, I'm not going to, you know, recommend any one place over the other. But the way I did it um, is... I took classes and I took classes where I could meet agents and get mm -hmm. in front of them. And once I was able to do that and, you know, whether it was sort of the whole speed meet thing where, you know, you rotate around, you know, there's one place that has a, something called print connection where they bring in five print agents and, you have a chance to do a half hour Q and A with them, and then everybody leaves the room, and then you come back in one on one, and you get a chance to do this round robin like speed dating, and mm -hmm. you meet with each agent for about three or four minutes. Mm -hmm. And I did that and got picked up by two agents, um, and then I continued to do some that were just the one on one agents and such, or I read for casting directors um you know i was totally beside myself i read for a casting director who a couple weeks later um contacted me and i went out for an american express commercial and then was totally beside myself when i got a call back for it Yay. um and as i you know as you i ran into him um uh, while after that and asked about the commercial and I was telling him you know I was so I said you know well I was so excited I, I got a call back on my first you know significant um commercial because that was a SAG one mm -hmm. and as it and I said but you know I've never seen it and as it turns out they I think they shot it but then they never aired it it changed huh. so um so the most I would have gotten would have been the whole fee um, but I wouldn't have experienced seeing what those residuals would have looked like mm -hmm. for it. But, um, you know, it's a lot of people will, you know, be in touch. They'll send the postcards with updates of what they're doing. And I don't discourage anyone from doing that. But having an opportunity to be in front of someone is far better than mailing a headshot in with a note because 
if you look at the amount of work that casting directors and agents probably do with all the email that they have to go through um, and you know there's this thought well you know snail mail may be a better way because everybody else is emailing everybody else is still thinking that too and they get swamped with what they have to go through Mm -hmm. wherever there's an opportunity that you can take a class and then you know you're present in the room you get to hear you know participate in a conversation in real time and have some you know physical presence and as far as I'm concerned there is no replacing that um you know of course it it with that comes some cost because then you have to pay for those sessions and so you should be strategic about who it is you want to get in front of. But, you know, there's so many places in the city that offer classes that you can meet with um, agents. And that is how they find talent a lot because, you know, there's nothing replacing seeing that person physically, um, hearing how they speak, how they look, you know, how they move, you know, what their personality is like based. And then you pair that up to what they're looking for for their roster of talent, which is mm -hmm. always sort of changing and evolving. So, you know, that would be my recommendation of the best way. Now, I can say with Donna Grossman, Donna, you know, we don't have a, um, we don't automatically call in people per se that we don't know. Typically, we go through one of two routes. Either we are calling in people who are with agents, who are already working with um, agencies, mm -hmm. or depending upon the role and what it is, we may put it up on casting networks and people can publicly submit. Mm -hmm. So there is an opportunity that you can submit yourself without an agent. Now, some people will submit and they do have an agent, but they may go may may opt to not put the agent down for that if they self-submitted. Right. And personally, I would say I totally agree with that because if the agent did not get you the work, then I would say, do should they get that commission? Right. And um, but you know, only the individual knows how they want to handle that relationship, you know, with their agent. But it's FaceTime, FaceTime, FaceTime. Um, and I don't mean that through um, Apple. I mean that in FaceTime as in the real live in-person FaceTime. Sure, sure. I think anything that replaces that. Yeah. And, and I ended up with, I think almost every agent that I ended up working with, I met, I got picked up through doing a seminar or class and that mm -hmm. was i at one point i think i was working with about four or five but shh, don't tell them because <laughs> they never want you to be with more than one right or two and and it's so interesting because you know we we're talking right now about new york new york city uh as far as how things go but there are other parts of the country la chicago mm -hmm. atlanta that also have uh, markets, maybe different right. focuses, but but markets for for acting certainly, and and we can go up into Vancouver, Toronto. There are, there are other places where if you are an actor and you're interested in pursuing this, that this is something that you might be able to do in other parts of the world besides New York mm -hmm. City. But I think what you said, Portia, is you know there's a lot to it that that this idea of get in front of the people that you want to work with and 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 give them the opportunity to see you but having right. said that um how do you how I mean, do you I mean, just showing up at their offices either which some people will still think <laughs> no really oh no yeah no 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 i don't mean like that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow i had no idea that that actually happened but okay so so how does an agent or, or actually more importantly, a casting director decides someone is right. Like an agent decides if someone is right to submit, but how does a, how does a casting director, you've seen, I don't know, 50 actors who all look the same, uh, all showing up in workout gear for this one commercial. How do you decide who's right for it? Well, first of all, they, 
aren't all going to look alike. Okay. Some may be taller, some may be shorter, some may be smaller. Um, you know, if, let's say if it's a female role, and then also it depends on categories mm -hmm. because they're all still, there are times that it may be open that they may be considering any female for roles. So let's just say it's a female 30s to 40s. Mm -hmm. That female could be Asian, that female could be Caucasian, that female could be Black, um, that female could be Indian if it's open. Other times the role may specifically require um, Asian and we've cast things where specifically that person had to be Chinese, for example, not look Chinese. So that meant you were sending someone who was Korean or Japanese. They had to be Chinese. Now that requirement was set by the client based mm -hmm. on maybe the product that they were using is something, particularly in farmer, it may be something that only affects people of Chinese descent, not mm -hmm. Japanese descent. But, you know, that's sort of the starting point. So it's not as if everyone's going to exactly look alike, but it's also the essence of what it is they're looking for in that person and how well they can convey what they're looking for. Um, and it's not always whether or not you did a great read. For example, if it's a, I can remember we were doing a casting a hood uh, yogurt, uh, hood cottage cheese rather commercial. Mm -hmm. And it, th there, were, there was no line. It was the person eating the yogurt. Mm -hmm. And it was all about how well that per those individuals took direction from the casting director and gave back to her what she had indicated she wanted. Interesting. There's some people who got it right. There's some people who just couldn't get it. Now, that doesn't mean that what they did was a bad take. It just says they weren't able to bring out that particular essence. You know, again, as I say, as an actor, I've learned so much working at, I always say every actor should have to work at a casting agency. Mm -hmm. Believe me, you would learn so much that would totally change how you walk into a room. But I don't think I had ever gone out for something where I had to eat on camera. And I made a point of watching it just to see the nuances of how you eat something that you, if your eyes are open or closed and the way you close them, whether it looks like it doesn't taste good or it tastes good, um, whether you know, that you're chewing, but you're not really chewing. And if you're having yogurt, you're not chewing it, so you shouldn't be chewing. You know, um, and it's how you turn the spoon, which way you hold it, all fascinating. Wow. But it, all got down to who was able to take that direction that was given when she said, okay, you know, this is what I want. I want you to do this. And then they go through it. And Donna's very good about really kind of giving people very, very good instruction, but also giving them, you know, a few takes to get it right. Probably more so than some other, you know, casting directors who you get like one or two and that's the standard and you get it, you get it in two, great, but they're not going to spend a whole lot of time. You know, Donna's really very wonderful in that, that she will really give her actors a little more time. But at the end of the day, it's who got that interpretation right and who followed those directions the right way. Mm. And it's very interesting to me how that is both so simple following directions but also so complicated, you know, because, because you, you have to almost be a blank slate. It sounds like, like, okay, I'm just going to be receiving what you are 
telling me, and I'm just going to try my darndest to give it back to you the way you asked for it, which in many ways is communication at its finest, you know, <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah. And I'm just yeah. now, so I want to thank you, Portia, because that is a realization that I have never had before in my entire life, in my many, huh? many years. So I want to thank you because I write on communication and that aspect of it has eluded me until, you know, how that meme goes, I was today years old before I realized. And, and so thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, well, I to share that, but as I said, it's, it's really great training ground. If I just say, if my wish, if I could make a wish come true, I think every working actor, whether it's voice or whatever, um, especially those that are really trying to make some real headway, they have a chance to just work at a casting agency for a day. One, you'll learn a lot, but two, not only will you learn information you didn't know, you will also learn the things that you shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, you will get great insight of the kind of things that you can do that can help make a difference in getting the work. And if you're a working actor, that's what it's about. So, okay, I'm going to ask you, I have just a couple more questions. And, mm -hmm. and then I know you have a life to get back to. Uh, so just a couple more, if you don't mind. What does success look like for you? <clears throat> Ooh. You're coming up with some really good questions that are <laughs> putting me on the spot and making me think. Um, ooh, um, wow. Do you want to think about that for a minute? Well, no, because see, my answer would be, and again, this is very specifically for me, you know, to ask a person who is a cancer survivor, what does success look like to you? My answer is, um, this is what it looks like. I already see this is what success looks like because I'm still here. So whatever it is I do after, you know, this time, it's all um, the icing, I suppose. Mm -hmm. It's all gravy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting. Uh, there's there's a, a tattoo that I've always wanted to get and have not yet gotten. And it's the words, I'm still here. It's such an uh -huh. interesting, it's such an interesting uh, juxtaposition of remembering yeah. who you are, where you are, and why you are all at the same time. So I, I, I find yeah. that fascinating. I have one that I want to get too. It's not going to be said so nicely like that um and um so let we can go get them together okay uh it's a date i would love it uh it's a date. <laughs> absolutely no absolutely we'll have to find a, a good tattoo artist we can if you know of a good tattoo artist uh drop me a line and especially in new york city or new jersey because there yeah. are two people who need tattoos <laughs> I, there's one I know I just I have who's done the ones that I um, some that I have I need to track her down because she's pretty much the only one I will trust but, ah I will take uh, your recommendation then <laughs> that, that, that there you go your your audience hears it now and we'll have to come back and have an update did we do it yeah I, it's I'm serious that's I, I know exactly where I want it and uh and it's going to happen. Um, we should definitely do that. That'll be, really, <laughs> and it, we'll do an episode again in a few months and here and put up the pictures here, here are our tattoos. Um, so, okay. I, I, I want to just make sure that people know how to find you. Uh, do you have a website? Oh, uh, okay. No. Okay. They, um, uh, they can find me on Instagram. Uh-huh. At I I am as in the letter I the letter M so Portia I'm so Portia uh -huh. is that what it is ah I love it <laughs> that's great and then on um, Twitter um, I am P R Ad Gal P R Ad Gal mm -hmm. I have. Uh, one of my dear friends and the accompanist when I do my singing music gigs, my accompanist and partner is Piano Gal. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. All right. P PR Ad Gal. Uh, and uh, I'm going to put that in the show notes so that people can find you and follow you and, and uh, you can 
in, increase your your followers and fans by a little bit that would be great yeah. and, and you know anyone who um wants to reach out and you know has any subsequent questions or thoughts or comments to share definitely um uh do that oh i appreciate you saying that thank you well i and thank you uh, i have one more question but first i want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me for the podcast i think you're you're so wise and so brilliant and so wonderful and i'm really grateful that that i got to, i have gotten to meet you and get to know you a little bit better so thank you so much for joining me for the show thank you, thank you. um you know hopefully it's you know it's it this has been just sort of my journey and it's the the view from you know where i see it and you know some things that have just sort of collided in my life and it happened still amaze me but um it's you know it's sort of my journey yeah. and always happy to share what I've learned on my very interesting sort of securitous route of life. Yeah. And, and you're still here and that is, I am still here. that's beautiful. And I love it. And I have one last question and huh? it's something that it's a, it's a strange little question, but it's a question that I ask everybody who's on the show. Okay. And, and the question is, if you had a plane, an airplane, and they were going to skywrite something for you that the whole world would see, what would you say? Wow. Uh, that the whole world would say, would see. Mm -hmm. The letter F mm -hmm. and cancer. Is that also your tattoo? Yes, it is. <laughs> I had a feeling that's that's very succinct. I appreciate that. Yeah, that that makes all sorts of makes all sorts of sense. Uh, and uh, and and I appreciate you being so um, so honest about that. I think that I'm so I'm really grateful to you for that and more power to you for not only th surviving, but thriving. Good for you. Yeah, because I am a thriver. I'm not, not a survivor. I'm a thriver. I always say that. Yep. I'm yeah. not a bit surprised. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, Portia, once again, thank you so much for being on the show. And it was great to have this chat. Yeah. Oh, so much fun. So delightful and so much wisdom dropped in such a short period of time. Hopefully. This oh you're so sweet if you like what you're hearing and obviously you did from today's episode please consider leaving a review on apple podcasts or itunes or uh, google wherever you listen leave a review comment let me know what are the things you're thinking about with respect to creativity and how we can be successful creatives in the business world and beyond until next time, I am thrilled that you were here. This is, again, Isolde Trachtenberg, and I send you all of my love. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2020. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg and I send you all of my love.